Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. Well, tonight's teaching is a simple time of reminder that there's nothing new under the sun and not only other situations which often reoccur. We often find that they're repeated on a regular basis and humankind doesn't seem to learn the lessons. The same solution is always the same. It's always that security and that trust in our Lord. But we hold fast to God's teaching, regardless of what the situation, and we look forward to his deliverance in all circumstances, not in our own understanding or our own strength. And as Jacob will expand tonight on Psalm 11, we see that that collapse of society that's just developed in such a hurry Ooh, in recent fun. times across the world. We look at situation in America with the p potential for a new president and the whole global agenda suddenly taking up a, ge up a gear. And already we see certain teachers and certain denominations, well-respected men of God of old, coming together in some sort of idea of global Christian solidarity, as if that's going to solve the problems. And we seem to miss the point that faith, truth, and trust are the bywords of our salvation. So those will probably be some of the things which Jacob will expand on in this scripture. But what I will ask you at the end of this, we will put this up as a recording over the weekend. Please share it with your friends, particularly those who don't see any danger, particularly those who don't recognize the world that perhaps you do with the insight and the wisdom the Lord's given you. So please look at that and see if you can pass it on to some of your friends who might not be as astute as you or may not be as well versed in the scriptures. But we open it up now to Jacob for Psalm chapter 11. Jacob, brother, it's all yours. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Thank you for joining us. And if this is web posted, our apologies to those in countries, Singapore and Australia, New Zealand, and the states and so forth who will be unable to join us because of the time zone differences. But for those who are with us, more than welcome in Jesus. Turn with me, please, to Psalm 11. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string to shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Read that verse again. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. <coughs> Upon the wicked, he will rain snares. Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous, he loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. What an appropriate psalm for the current dilemma in which the body of Christ, particularly the faithful believers in an age of apostasy, presently find themselves, all of us. It opens by telling us that this is the psalm of David, and this model of David in Hebrew, but the Lord is our refuge. No matter what happens, no matter what takes place in the spheres of economy or politics or popular culture, no matter what takes place, we will always have the same refuge. Our refuge will be in the Lord no matter what transpires. Now, I've had the blessing of having my eyes open by speaking in certain countries, Islamic countries and communist countries where believers are persecuted. And I've seen the body of Christ under tremendous pressure. I've known believers who were put in prison for their faith and things of this nature in Vietnam and I shouldn't say the countries, sorry. Be that as it may, um, 
the Lord has always been their refuge. No matter what happens, there is a refuge. Extraneous circumstances will never affect the relationship we have with Jesus, no matter what. He was forsaken by the Father on our behalf, but we will never be forsaken. He was abandoned on our behalf, taking our sin and the curse of our sin and the judgment for our sin in order to give us salvation. But we will not have to endure those things because he did. He lost his refuge. We will never lose ours because of him. No matter what happens, we have to understand he will always be our refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? <laughs> There's no easy way out of this mess. There's no easy way out of this mess. The rain falls on the just and on the unjust. When you read the book of Exodus, the Israelites went through most of the plagues that the Egyptians did until the last one. Believers have always gone through these things. The Lord never promises we will not go through these things. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fires of the oven. But the fourth man in the oven with them was undoubtedly a Christophany. It was Jesus. He will always go before us, and he will always be with us. And in the end, we will come out victorious. Of these things, we may be sure. But this is not simply an emotional pep talk. It's reality. It's unfailing reality. It continues. The wicked bend the bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string to shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. I warned some years ago, and I was not the only one, homosexuality, lesbianism, these things will become more and more militant and more and more anti-Christian. The pro-abortion lobby will become more and more militant, more and more anti-Christian, <clears throat> and there will be a schism in the church. Not the schisms we've always known, like Catholic and Protestant, or evangelical and non-evangelical. Not those kinds of schisms. A schism among people who profess to be born again. In an age of apostasy, there will be a schism within what previously had been considered the true body of Christ. And a man's enemies will be the member of his own household. It is not simply pro-abortion activists or militant homosexuals who hate us. It is other Christians who compromise with those things. And they are compromising. They are compromising. I was reading some things on Premier Radio last week, and it was saying that despite the fact that certain political figures are pro-abortion and pro-same-sex marriage, they're still Christian. I don't know what Bible they're reading, but they should read about what happened in the Valley of Ben-Hinnom and what God thought about people who killed babies. Nonetheless, this is it. There's a schism even among believers. I saw this schism coming, as did many people, and many of you even, some years ago. It began with things like the ecumenical movement. Those who would compromise on fundamental biblical truth for the sake of a counterfeit unity with Rome, with other denominations that were not scripturally founded or based on the gospel. That was perhaps the beginning. Then, of course, after that, it became things like the counterfeit revivals, things that were plainly carnal, some of it demonic, but in no sense a revival. Every revival, biblically and historically, of course, has begun with people weeping, not with people laughing. Revival is the church repenting and returning to its first love and God pouring his spirit upon it. Uh, revival is not a lot of people getting saved. A lot of people getting saved is the result of revival and the proof of the pudding that it happened. We've had one false revival after another. Whole denominations taken over by false teachers telling people things were moves of God that were certainly not moves of God. And we see what's happened to society and the church since then. There was no revival. They had a lying spirit. Well, now we go even further. Now we see fundamental division among believers 
on the most essential of moral issues. Sexuality, aborting babies for no clinical reason or for no medical warrant, things that are most essential. Uh, major evangelical figures calling for acceptance of these things. In the course of Britain, it was Steve Chalk. Uh, then in, in the United States, Tony Campolo with these people, and J.D. Greer, the president of the Southern Baptist, the largest supposedly evangelical denomination in the United States, demanding that saved Christians be the number one spokesman for, for homosexual rights. This is the Baptist Convention, Southern Baptist Convention. It is unbelievable. We now see a third order of division, of schism. The foundations are being destroyed. They're getting ready to shoot arrows. They're loaded and they're getting ready to shoot. There is going to be a diabolical attack on the body of Christ beyond anything we've ever experienced. Of course, Jesus warned us, you'd be hated by all nations on account of me and account of my namesake. Now it's a related but separate issue with the pre-tribulation argumentation. This idea that because you live in a Western Protestant democracy, you're not going to be persecuted, that somehow we're different or immune from the things that Christians in areas of Africa or Asia or the, or the Muslim world or from the communist nations are subjected to, we're somehow immune because we're British or American or Canadian or Australian. This is a complete lie. In fact, I've spent so much time in those other countries, I can tell you that the church there and the believers there where they're persecuted are more faithful than the Christians in the West. I've unfortunately said this many times and it's an indictment of myself as much as is an indictment of anyone. I have seen and met true Christians in Great Britain. I've met true Christians in the United States and Canada and Australia and New Zealand and South Africa and, and Europe. I've met true Christians in all of these countries in the Western world. I've met true Christians. But the only place I've seen true Christianity, like the book of Acts, is where the church is persecuted. I'm sorry to say that. I wish it was not like that. But that is my witness and my testimony and my experience. I've been around this planet many times and seen Christians in many countries. The spotless bride is not to be found in California or in Cornwall or in Ontario or in Victoria. The spotless bride is the one who's being prepared for her husband. There's a purging going on. And that purging will come to the developed world. It'll come to the Western world. You'll be hated by all nations. Do not believe this misplaced idea that we're going to be rescued before any of this happens. The church is not in a state to be rescued. Most of Western Christianity is not holy enough unto the Lord to be ready to meet him. Now, again, many individual Christians are. I'm not saying that there are not individual Christians who are. And I'm not suggesting that there are not some good churches and some good fellowships. <clears throat> Praise God, there are. But it is undoubtable. It, 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 it can't be doubted that we live in an age of apostasy and things are deteriorating. They're getting ready to shoot their arrows at us. They have an agenda. Social media, we're speaking now by Zoom, by social media. I can assure you, and I'm not trying to give a political editorial, but the robber barons in, in Silicon Valley in California, those people have a left-wing agenda. They are not friendly to Christians. They're closing down Christian websites. They're calling things hate speech if you're pro-life or if you don't agree with same-sex marriage, they're saying that this is hate speech and they're suspending your accounts. Until now, it's been somewhat sequestered. 
what's going to happen if it's not sequestered? Well, they're going to shoot those arrows. Those words are going to come at us. Just yesterday, I watched a video clip made by unsaved people mocking Christians, major Christian leaders who were prophesying Donald Trump was going to win the election. Well, if by the hand of God, Mr. Trump remains president, it'll be because of the judicial process, not because of the electoral process. <laughs> they prophesied falsely. The only possible way constitutionally he can remain in office is by judicial means if the Supreme Court puts the elections back into the hands of the House of Representatives of the state legislatures. But by election, no way. They prophesied falsely. And you know what? They'll go on and prophesy falsely again. And many naive, gullible, and undiscerning Christians will believe it. But I watched this website yesterday of unsaved people mocking them. They were showing film clips of all of these Christians who were predicting Mr. Trump was going to win. <clears throat> As Jeremiah said, they prophesy from the futility and deception of their own mind. The foundations are destroyed in verse 3. What can the righteous do? When the foundations are destroyed, we have to understand something. It is not sudden. There were cracks in the foundation for some time. There was an underlying damage to the solidity of the foundation itself. It began to crack in an invisible subterranean way it began to crack. Things were wrong. Now the foundation begins to cave in. And we see this everywhere. A number of years ago, I warned, and again, I'm not trying to misrepresent myself as a prophetic figure or to say I was the only one saying such things. <clears throat> but I said, what happened in Great Britain is going to happen in America unless there's a real repentance. After Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones and Campbell Morgan and F.F. F. Bruce went to be with the Lord, control of the body of Christ in the UK went into the hands of hypocritical hype artists, theocrats, false teachers. There was no more standard. The foundation of British evangelicism was essentially gone, certainly on any kind of an institutional or denominational level. It was gone after Martin Lloyd-Jones and Campbell Morgan, G. Campbell Morgan and F.F. F. Bruce, it was gone, gone. The foundation cracked. You had people who were part of the foundation of the body of Christ in Britain <clears throat> who already were cracking. The annihilationism and the anti-Zionism of John Stott well, he was considered to be foundational to British evangelicism. He's only one example. We saw what happened with the Pentecostal denominations, particularly after the counterfeit revivals. This is not traditional British Pentecostalism. We saw what happened when the Baptist Union of Britain joined churches together and got in bed with Rome. The foundations began to crack. Martin Lloyd-Jones, G. Campbell Morgan, F.F. F. Bruce, and some others with Jesus. What's left? A broken foundation. And so I said about 15, 20 years ago, maybe 15 to 18 years ago in the United States, what is going to happen when David Wilkerson is no longer here? When Dave Hunt is no longer with us? when Chuck Smith is no longer with us. Were those men perfect? No, they weren't, but they were godly and they loved the Lord and they stood on the basic truths of scripture without compromise. I told my American friends, what happened in Britain will come to America. There'll be no more pillars. There'll be no more foundations. Hucksters, hype artists are going to get control of everything like they did in Britain. 
it'll be the end. America, even the Bible belts like the United States and Northern Ireland are running on the inertia of their once Christian past. Inertia will only take you so far for so long. The foundations are crumbling. This is undeniable. Now, <clears throat> there is growth and hope in the third world, but the third world is super saturated with problems. Those churches indeed grow. Evangelism is not a problem, but certainly what is a problem is discipleship and theological education and having biblically literate leaders and persecution and poverty. The church in the third world has many problems of its own, how be it not the same problems that we have in the West. No, <clears throat> there's something wrong with the foundation. And there's no denying it, but people still deny it. I look at what's happened. In the last two weeks, in the last two weeks, two major evangelical leaders in the United States fell from grace. Actually, they fell from grace long before that, but it became publicly, publicly evident. Now, again, I'm not delighting in this by any means, and I'm not throwing stones and I'm slinging mud, but it's publicly known. It's in the secular media. I think of what happened with Hillsong. The leader of Hillsong in the United States was Carl Linz, appointed by Hillsong in Australia. This guy would not speak against homosexuality. He compromised on all kinds of things. He was a hipster Christian. But we also find out he was sexually immoral and has been for some time. When you see wrong doctrine, it's usually emblematic of flawed morality. When people go off spiritually, they go off morally, and when they go off doctrinally, that is a symptom of it. You saw this? I wasn't surprised. He had the Hillsong Women's Conference in New York where Jesus came out in female drag as the American Statue of Liberty with the crown of the Statue of Liberty instead of the crown of thorns. I was born, I was born, physically born, in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty. <clears throat> and it comes out. Uh, and they're singing the Frank Sinatra song, New York, New York to Jesus. That was their worship session. Just two or 3,000 Christian women. Then they bring out the naked cowboy with cowboy boots, a cowboy hat and a guitar. That's it. And it gets in the secular media, it gets on the internet. This is Hillsong. Should we be surprised? Well, the person who removed him was the leader of Hillsong from Australia, Brian Houston. Brian Houston was found guilty by the Royal Commission who investigated it in Australia of protecting his homosexual pedophile father. I thought you think he was a Jesuit or something. This open scandal on national TV in Australia. So Australia, the Australian is going to fire the American one. What's the difference? That whole thing is saturated with, with corruption. The foundations crack. So too, week before last, Jerry Falwell's son files a lawsuit against Liberty University, where he used to be the head honcho up until about a month ago. Photos on the internet. Very lewd posings with a woman he was not married to. Ah. And now he's suing them because they, the board was forced to fire him because of the alumnus being angry about it. This is the biggest evangelical institution of higher learning in the developed world. The foundations are cracking. The foundations are cracking. The decline we see in, in Great Britain, there's no stopping it. There's no stopping it. The foundations are gone. I shall never forget the night. I will never forget in my life the night when the first homosexual and lesbian service took place at Southwark Cathedral, where Christians were persecuted and martyred under Queen Mary I 
Bloody Mary, as she's colloquially called. In Southern Cathedral, you had lesbian and homosexual Anglican clergy <clears throat> dressed in their vestments, holding hands and kissing in the church. A very thin line of protest was in front of it. The supposedly evangelical Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, George Carey, said and did nothing, nothing. And that same night, that same night when this abomination took place across the Thames and Holy Trinity Brompton, Sandy Miller and Nicky Gumbel had people on the floor laughing in hysterics, saying it was a revival. This really happened. This is Anglicanism. It's unbelievable. Is that the Anglicanism of Ridley, Latimer, Hooper, Tyndale? I don't think so. Not of Cranmer, I don't think so. But those gentlemen had a foundation. The foundation is now gone. However, we go on reading, what can the righteous do? Well, what shall we do? The foundations of evangelicism in the Western world are cracking. What can we do? In fact, they're probably irreparably cracking. Verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The true church will always be holy, set apart to him. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. Of course, this is an anthropomorphism. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. He tests both the righteous and the wicked. The Lord is allowing faithful believers, honest believers, committed believers, true believers to undergo hardship. It'll prove who is his. Not in his eyes, he already knows. He wants us to know who the faithful church is that will be ready for his son's return. He wants us to know. The Lord is exposing the faithful church from the apostate church. Again, I'm not talking about Rome or liberal Protestants or the World Council of Churches or Eastern Orthodoxy or cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. We all know they're apostate. In fact, they're not even apostate, some of them. They never had the truth to begin with. They never apostatized from the truth because they always believed the lie. Certainly that was the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. No. The Lord is testing. Faithful believers are having a hard time right now. Upon the wicked, he will rain snares. They will become entrapped. Fire and brimstone. Now that's the language of hell. Our dear friend and brother now with the Lord, David Parson, did an excellent series about the reality of hell. He was essentially refuting, not by name, but in essence of what he was saying, he was opposing what was being taught by John Stott and by Roger Foster at the time. Some of us knew, knew David Paulson. Again, I called him when he was alive. I told him he was the last of the Mohegans, <clears throat> to use the Americanism. He was the last truly great British Bible expositor going back to the tradition of people like Spurgeon. He was the end of it. He was the end of it. And one of his closing warnings was about the reality of hell. Fire and brimstone. <clears throat> Burning wind will be the portion of their cup. Now this cup, of course, corresponds to the cup of wrath in the book of Revelation. The Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. Jesus is coming. We have a refuge, and he's coming. Despite all this other mess, in the end, because of Jesus, we win. In the end, victory is assured for the faithful church. 
We'll always have that refuge, and we have a certain hope. Not a hope that I wish, of course, as most of you know in the Greek language, but a definition of hope that means a future fact. A future fact. Now let's talk about the temple. The word temple, <clears throat> there's different Hebrew words, Mishkan, Bet Mikdash, and so forth. But in the New Testament, seven times, using various Greek terms, Oikos, Hegios, Heron, Maos, seven times the New Testament tells us the church is the temple. The Lord is in heaven, but by his spirit, he's dwelling in his temple and it is holy. Is now destroyed or is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Hebrew term for foundation, well, in modern Hebrew, it's uh, mimsad, mimsad. But when you see things, he will establish, ya asud, that has, has that root. And it could be a foundation in terms of, of belief, of what you believe, or it could also be an ar architectural meaning of, of, of foundation. It's ambiguous in Hebrew. The context can vary. But let's look at Isaiah chapter 28, please. Isaiah 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. This is obviously a messianic prophecy about the Lord Jesus. And he is the cornerstone of the foundation. The cornerstone in Hebrew, or in the ancient Jewish world, was not like our cornerstone. Our cornerstone is a stone of dedication of a building or an edifice that has the date of construction engraved on it or embossed on it. That's our cornerstone. In Hebrew, it's Rosh Pina, literally the head of a corner. It is the stone that exerts pressure on other stones and holds them in place. It is a stone that exerts a pressure on the other stones that hold them in place, particularly with arched architecture, but generally speaking, it's the stone that holds the others in place. He's there. He's there. He's not going anyplace. But there's more to the foundation than just him. He is the foundation in that he holds the foundation in place. He's the precious cornerstone that is the foundation. But we have to understand what this word foundation means in the New Testament. The New Testament has separate terms, one for the uh, architecture, but the other is the term, as we think of the foundations, themelios or themelio, themelios. Let's look at what the New Testament tells us, bearing in mind the church is prefigured in the Old Testament typologically by the temple. We are the temple not made with, with hands, it says in 1 Peter 2, 5, etc. Let's look at some of these passages. Look with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, the Melios. Having been built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Same word in the Septuagint that you have in Isaiah 28. 
in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple to the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. Now notice, he's the cornerstone, but the rest of the foundation consists of apostles and prophets, apostles and prophets. In the present apostasy, we have the new apostolic reformation associated with figures such as Bill Johnson, the Tikkun movement in Israel, etc. Jesus warned the Ephesians, this very same church, Jesus warned them in the book of Revelation chapter 2 about false apostles. In Great Britain, in the restoration movement of the 1980s, we had the same idea with these uh, restorationists of, 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 of Gerald Coates and Barney Coombs and Terry Virgo. These people were ascribing to themselves some kind of an apostolic position. Well, there are different kinds of apostles in the New Testament, at least five major type. But the only kind that exists now are church planting missionaries. They're the only kind, those who were sent out to plant other churches. There are no apostles like Paul or Peter or James. They, they saw the Lord and they were inspired to write the New Testament. But what happens when you had people ascribing to themselves an apostolic authority? Now, this had always been a characteristic of Roman Catholicism. The Pope claimed to be heir of Peter, and he lives in a house in, in St. Peter's Square in the Vatican that's actually called the Apostolic pa Palace. Roman Catholicism always had this, but it came into the Restoration Movement in Great Britain. Those were the same people who followed the Kansas City false prophets. Those were the same people who bought into the counterfeit revivals. What happened? False apostles are all over the place. Today, it's called the New Apostolic Reformation. And then the apostles have the prophets, New Testament prophets. Unfortunately, as in the days of Micaiah and Elijah and Jeremiah, for every true prophet, there seems to be dozens, if not hundreds, of false ones. Just go on the internet and see the nonsense they predict that is time-specific in the name of the Lord. By biblical definition, these people are proven false prophets. They are proven false prophets. And those who continue to follow them instead of calling them to repentance are partakers, sharers in their wickedness and deception. Apostles and prophets are the foundation held in place by Jesus. Well, he's all right. But the people we call apostles now and the people we call prophets now, most of them aren't. Foundation's in trouble. When the foundation is destroyed, what can the righteous do? Look at the mainstream leadership of the church. Look what it is. Where is a Martin Lloyd-Jones? Where is a David Pawson or a Campbell Morgan in Britain? Where is a David Wilkerson or a, or a Dave Hunt? Where are they? They're not here anymore. What you have now It's a cracked foundation, a foundation that had been cracking for some time, but now it's dismantling. Let's continue looking, Matthew chapter 7, verse 25, please. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. 
in Greek, the Petron. Jesus is called the pet by the feminine in First Corinthians ten of of, pet, of uh, not pet, Petros but Petra is called by the feminine. Also, we are told in First Corinthians three we can build on no other foundation except Him. Now, when you understand the original Greek, among other things, this completely debunks the Roman Catholic claim of the primacy of Peter as the rock. Peter is the pet. Uh, Petros, the small pebble or the chip of stone coming out of the cave at, at Banyas today, at the Caesarea Felipe. He is not the foundation stone upon which the temple of Pan had been built and so forth. If you've been to Israel, as Chris Hill has, for instance, you, you know exactly what I mean. Uh, he is the Petron. He is the rock. He is it. If it's built on him, it doesn't matter what happens, it's gonna stand. In the early church, pagan Rome tried to exterminate Christianity under these terrible, terrible demon-possessed emperors, most of them sexually perverted, if not all of them. Decius and Diocletian and Septimus Severitus, Marcus Aurelius, Caligula, one worse than the other, going back to Nero, terrible people, undoubtedly demonized. But the more they persecuted, the more the church grew, the gates of hell could not prevail against it. Uh, again, the gates of hell goes back again to Banyas, to the, to the entrance cave of the uh, whirlpool, where the uh, priests of Pan sacrificed the goats. Be that as it may, I only mention that in passing. It's the local archeology span of what Jesus said these things about building upon the rock. He is the rock. It's not going to crumble. <clears throat> but you get some other foundation that's independent of him? How can anybody who wants to compromise with same-sex marriage and homosexuality and abortion, how can such a person say they're standing on Christ? It's logically and theologically impossible. The salvation come by grace, are we saved by grace through faith? Is it being born again? Or are we saved by ex opere operato sacramental rituals? Did Christ die once and for all, or did he continue to die sacrificially and sacramentally in the Mass? Remember, the Reformers, they were all Roman Catholic clergy. Nearly all of them were Roman Catholic clergy who through the study of the original languages and so forth, came to understand Rome had a false gospel and still does, but you've got people saying the Pope is a believer. Yeah, the Pope, what did he say two months ago? It's okay for two men to have a marriage and to adopt children, bring the children up to be homosexual as long as you send them to Catholic school and bring them up in the Catholic church. This is what he's teaching. And you've got major evangelicals saying that this is all right. Now notice, the Pope says he's the vicar of Christ, Vicarius Christus. Latin, Vicarius Christus, translated into Greek, as I've said many times, Antichristus, the one who's in place of Christ. Christ said one thing, he made them male and female. None of the effeminate shall enter the kingdom. No, the Pope says different. This is Antichrist. He's antichrist not only in religious title, he's antichrist in doctrine. He's putting his teaching in place of the teaching of Christ. But you've got believers going along with it. The foundation is destroyed. The foundation is destroyed. Well, let's look further. Turn with me, please to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. We've mentioned it, but let's look at it. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, 
and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. No man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We have people building churches on something other than Jesus and his teaching. Oh, they may use the name of Jesus emblematically or ritually or liturgically, but it's not the teaching of Jesus. He is the Logos. He is the Logos incarnate. It's not Jesus. They build on another foundation. One of the many reasons the charismatic movement did not bring revival, and by the way, I am not a cessationist. I am a continuationist. I believe the doctrine that the gifts of the Spirit ended with the apostles is completely false. I'm a continuationist. But the charismatic movement is something else. I saw people trying to build a church not on Jesus, but on the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit always points people to Christ, never himself. <laughs> and they were into the, come Holy Spirit, we worship you, Holy Spirit, let your fire fall, good morning, Holy Spirit. None of that was scriptural. The Holy Spirit is indeed God and addressed in prayer as God within the context of the triunity of the Godhead, absolutely. Holy, holy, holy God in three persons, that's biblical, no problem. But to extract the Holy Spirit and make him the foundation, that's not his function within the Godhead. So they began looking for experience and emotionalism and mysticism, thinking this was spirituality, but it was not. Wrong foundation. Patristic theology. Instead of apostolic theology, what the church fathers say is what they build on. Mainstream Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, and Eastern Orthodoxy are not primarily apostolic. They are patristic. They are built on not what the New Testament actually teaches, but on what the church fathers said about it. Particularly the post-Nicene fathers, who essentially rewrote Christianity as a Greek philosophy. Separate subject, big subject, but a related subject. Wrong foundation. If you build on a wrong foundation, it's only a matter of time before you get in trouble. I had no problem thinking my whole life as a saved believer that Eastern Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism or the World Council of Churches were, were false Christianity. I, I had no problem saying they were false. But what happens when you have to look at the realities of what had been mainstream evangelical denominations just as apostate, just as morally bankrupt? This is not good. When that happens, the foundation is destroyed. What can the righteous do? Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 6, verses 48 and He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation at the Medios on the rock. When a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. Remember in Hebrews, before Christ comes, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Doesn't matter if it's Liberty University, it doesn't matter if it's the Southern Baptist Convention or Hillsong, it can be shaken and it will be shaken. The foundation is no good. 
I visited a number of times invitations to speak in Christchurch, New Zealand. <coughs> I've been there quite a number of times before the earthquakes and after. It's unbelievable. I saw what an earthquake can do in Christchurch, but only one building collapsed. Others had to be torn down, but only one collapse killing a few hundred people. You'd think it was a miracle that thousands. Of course, the Anglican Cathedral was also knocked down, but that was God's judgment. I saw Osaka, Japan after the earthquake. And I've been in small earthquakes in California various times, and I know people have been there during larger ones. Those buildings can withstand earthquakes. They're built a certain way. But in China, when you leave Guangzhou, or you leave Shenzhen, or you leave Shanghai or Beijing, the construction is very shabby, cheap concrete, not steel reinforced, not good foundations. And when they had that terrible earthquake in China several years ago, everything collapsed. It's built on garbage. You look at the worst earthquakes and their consequences are always the third world. Or, or countries where building standards are not observed. The earthquake is coming. The seismic activities in the last days that Jesus predicted will happen seismologically, but they are expressions, reflections of spiritual shaking. Uh, much the same as the famines are reflective of Famines for hearing of the word of God. Uh, these things literally exist in the physical sense, but they reflect deeper spiritual things. The shakings. Everything is being shaken. But let's look just a little bit further. Let's look at Luke chapter 14, verse 29, please. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Here you have the introduction of the Greek term katabolis, where we get catabolism. What is it saying? People have tried to build churches on wrong foundations, and it was inevitable that they would implode. Again, let's just look at the last several years. I've said this a number of times. I don't say it by way of ridicule or delight, but let's look. What happened to Bill Hybels Church, Willow Creek in Chicago? The biggest evangelical church in the United States, Calvary Chapel, cost, uh, Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, Bob Coy. What happened? What has become of the Airport Vineyard Church in Toronto, Canada, the Mecca for Charismania? What happened in Pensacola, Florida at Brownsville Assemblies of God after the split and financial scandal? What happened in Lakeland, Florida? What happened to the first, first consumer-friendly church, Crystal Cathedral, Robert Schuller, in California? These things are gone. Unless the Lord builds a house that cannot stand. The labor's labor in vain. Oh, you can build it. You can build it. You can build a maverick church. You can get a big church. You can even get a big church quick if you entertain people enough. Well, as someone once said, when you use entertainment to draw people, you have to use entertainment to keep the people. Pretty soon you run out of tricks and new songs. 
Just look at Hillsong in America now. No one. Doesn't matter. I think of what happened with Ken God's church up in Sunderland. The show was over. The freak show was over. The foundation was wrong. Catabolism. It's a biological term for the organic breakdown, but it happens structurally. The body of Christ is a living organ. We have a term called Hashtut in Hebrew. Hashtut. And it's interesting. The established things. Look with me, please, to Ezra chapter 3, verse 11. They come back from the Babylonian captivity and the Lord tells them to rebuild the house with Haggai, Ezra, and Nehemiah. So they proceed to do that in chapter 3. What happens? They sang praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his loving kindness is forever and ever. What were they so elated about? What gave them such delight? Why were they so celebratory in what they were doing in Ezra chapter 3? Well, we're told they began to celebrate because the foundation had been laid. You look at it. Verse 2, they laid the foundation so they could build the altar. They set up the altar on its foundation. Once the foundation was there, they began to celebrate as if the project was already finished. Well, the project was not already finished, but once the foundation is there, once it's the right foundation, you can be sure the project will be finished. The right foundation will always guarantee the desired end. The wrong foundation will, in the long term, always guarantee failure. When the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Let's try to observe our experience over the last one to two decades, particularly the last decade, in light of these teachings about the medias, about the medios. Let's look at some of these things. There's been a series of events that dictated the world could not go back to the way it had been. September 11th being one, the economic crash of 2008, BlackRock here in uh, Lehman Brothers in the States. Things could not go back the way it was. After COVID-19, things will not be able to go back to the way they were. Not for secular society, not for the world and its institutions, and not for the church. Things cannot be the way it used to be. We may regain elements of it, but it's never going to be the same again. We have to accept that. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I do see that this gift from China to the world is being politically orchestrated for a reason. Uh, again, these absentee ballots account for the fraud vote fraud in America to try to get rid of a president who wasn't a globalist and who was strongly supportive of, of, of Israel and of evangelicals. Uh, that's just one example. It's being manipulated. I'm not going to get into the debate about the vaccines and so forth, but plainly it is going that direction. Things can't be the same after September 11th, after 2008 crash, after COVID-19. It can't go back to the same. It's not going to happen. Neither will the church be the same. 
There were churches now that can't pay the pastor's salaries. There were churches now that can't meet the mortgage payments on their properties. There are places in the world, including the United States, where you can gather to have a riot, to tear down a statue. Britain the same. You can assemble to tear down a statue of Churchill in England, or to tear down a statue of even Abraham Lincoln in the United States, but you can't go to church. Families are being told they can't celebrate Thanksgiving and they're being told to spy on each other. This is in America. Things are not gonna be the same again. They're not gonna be the same. The enemy has a bow and a quiver loaded with arrows and the body of Christ is the target. But we have a refuge and we have a destiny. When the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? I accept the fact that the foundations of society, constitutional government, parliamentary democracy, these things are in peril and in decline. Western democracy from its inception was influenced by people who believed in God. On the outside of the parliament in London, Westminster, Paranaster Quius and Chelius from the Vulgate, our father who art in heaven. The founders of American presidential democracy and for all their faults, the English Puritans with Cromwell knew democracy could only work if we were governed by men who were governed by God. They've thrown God out, the foundation is gone. So democracy is crumbling. That's a given. But the constitution of the church is the word of God. It doesn't matter to people anymore the way it once did. It just doesn't matter. But it will matter to those who count. I am not despondent. I am, however, somewhat flabbergasted. Not by what is happening, not by so much what is transpiring, but by the pace at which it is transpiring. Going back 20 years ago, I saw people apostatizing and going into all matter of doctrinal error. Pastors and preachers who I'd always thought were biblically solid, who were scripturally well grounded theologically. They were doctrinally very much founded on, on the teachings of scripture. And they would end with all this nonsense and they feared man instead of God. So they compromised with things that they knew were wrong. This was particularly true in things like the Elam movement and so forth. Most unfortunate, most unfortunate, they destroyed their own heritage. But it was the pace at which it happened. It's the pace at which these things are happening. It would have been unthinkable to say that be born again Christians, saying that the church should change its position on same sex marriage, homosexuality, abortion, but it's happening. This would have been unthinkable even 10, 12, 15 years ago but it's the order of the day, foundations of God. Jesus warned the false prophets in the last days, they're here. He warned the false apostles to the Ephesians. Oh boy, they made a big comeback. No, we've lost our foundation, dear friends. We've lost our foundation in terms of anything institutional or denominational or structural. We've lost our foundation. But there is one foundation that will never crack. There is one foundation that will always remain solid. Apostles, prophets, denominational leaders, theological voices, <laughs> okay. Read the book of Lamentations, it's the same kind of thing. Okay. But there's a precious stone laid in Zion. 
a very precious stone that's been laid in Zion. That stone is not going any place. It's there, and it always will be there. Once again, we conclude looking at Ishayahu Hanavi, Isaiah the prophet, chapter 28. The Lord's doing something. Therefore, in verse 16, thus says the Lord God, not James Jacob Pratt, thus says the Lord God, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone. Jesus was tested to the utmost, a costly cornerstone with a foundation firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. There's no getting around it. Foundation is being destroyed. But the precious cornerstone, if we truly believe and trust him, we should not be disturbed. We can't ignore these things. We can't circumvent the reality of these things. We can't evade the repercussions of these things by and large. But what the Lord has told us, it seems disturbing, very disturbing. But he tells us, don't be disturbed. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for listening. God bless. Jacob, thank you very much. Next week, Lord willing, Lord willing, will be on the parousia, the rapture, return of Christ. Is it countdown, stand down, or lockdown? (laughs) Jacob, thank you. Excellent, as usual. For those of you that joined us during the program, thank you very much. There'll be obviously bits that you have missed. This will be recorded, it is being recorded, and it will be released uh, in the next few days to RTN TV. Um, for those of you who don't know anything about RTN TV, I'll just put it on the screen while Jacob just gets a quick uh, refreshment break before we go into any of your questions. RTN TV Thank you, Thank you, is a combination of different ministries, Moriel, um, Marco Quintana from Devor, John Haller, um, various other ministries who preach the gospel in a similar way to to an audience who understand that these are perilous times and they need to be fed. So if you've never been to RTN TV, you can see the website there, rtntv.org. Please go there. Many of you tonight joined us because you had a mail drop from RTN TV, and we're glad that worked tonight. It was the first time we have tried it. So thank you very much, Charles, for getting that organized. If you go to RTN TV and you want to subscribe, any future videos, Mm -hmm. programs, or events that we're running, you will get advanced notice of that through the subscription. It's just simply your details, the email address, will be kept um, and preserved by us, and it will be secure. So please Mm -hmm. do take a a walk along to rtntv.org for any events that's going on. It will also go out on on Morial TV. Um, Jacob, I was going to ask you a question in relation to uh, verse five, we only got us far, verse three tonight. So while everyone else is in which chapter, and, and what we just read on, on Psalm eleven, but it doesn't okay. matter. What, what I've noticed tonight, Jacob, and it was only during your discussion that I realised it. There are parallels with Job here in verses one to three, where David has sought the counsel of brethren, and we are encouraged by the Lord to seek the, the counsel of brethren. <clears throat> but how do we strike that balance for what? people who we respect and we are poll tellers and what the Lord tells us. Because Jacob, uh, David stood his ground here. He heard the, the, the counsel from these other people, but he understood what the Lord had led him. And he followed the Lord's um, direction. How do we strike that balance? First of all, what the Lord is saying through some other person will always be in agreement with Scripture doctrinally. It yeah. will always be in complete 
doctrinal agreement with the Word of God. Second is the witness of the Holy Spirit. Lord, don't let me be deceived. Lord, I want to do your will. Lord, guide me by your Spirit. We don't have to worry about doing the Holy Spirit's job for him. If we really seek the Lord's will, he'll show us what it is. Then, of course, there's the practical things. David had some very sinister people telling him things, but he also had some good people telling him things. <clears throat> Look at the character and reputation and history of the individual who's telling you. <laughs> yep, good advice. Thank you for that, Jacob. Well, if anyone would like to ask Jacob a question, simply unmute your microphone. And if you want to ask that hey, question. Miss, I have a question. Okay, is that, you who's that, sir? Is that Art? That's Sarge. Art, oh, bless you, brother. Please go ahead. Um, the temple, or the church becomes a temple in the New Testament. How would we explain that without conflating it with kingdom now theology, replacementism, and that kind of thing, because it sounds kind of like that, although I know that's not what you mean. Replacement theology is fundamentally unscriptural. It's fundamentally, supersessionism is just not biblical. But the entire Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, is a shadow of the New. Everything in the Old Testament foreshadows the New. It is a type or a, a shadow of what comes in Christ. That's the Hebrew Holy Days. That's the Levitical sacrificial system. That's the temple. That's everything. The entire law and prophets, all of it, is fulfilled in Christ. Not to the negation of what it meant literally, and not to the negation of the prophetic purposes of God for Israel, but it's all a shadow fulfilled in Christ. There are adequate New Testament passages, seven in all, that make it clear that the temple and its architecture or foreshadowings of, of the church. We have a teaching, a very old teaching I did many years ago on temple typology where we deal with this. Um, the early church was meeting in Solomon's portico, remembering the warning of Jesus and the prophecies of Daniel chapter nine, that the second temple was gonna be destroyed. But while the second temple was going to be destroyed in fulfillment of the prophecies of Jesus and Daniel, the Lord had a new temple already under construction. That was the body of Christ, meeting right next to it in Solomon's portico. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, okay, thank you, Jacob. Did that answer the question, Sarge? Yeah, I think so. It, <clears throat> it just, um, to explain that the new, that the church, or the temple becomes a church, it just, I, I wasn't oh, no, I, was a I didn't confused. say the temple becomes the church. I said the temple foreshadows the church. <clears throat> okay. It's the Old Testament shadow of it. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, that's good. Thank you. Bless you. And where are you, Sarge? Yes, where, where are you located? Canada. Oh, Canada. Okay. Yeah, up in the frozen north here. Mm. Dear Jacob. Dear Jacob. Chris uh, Job. Can I just introduce people to Chris Choff? While we've been doing the program tonight, you've probably seen Chris Choff's mouth doing this. He's been busy translating the whole program to our brethren in, in Eastern Europe. So thank you very much, Chris Choff. You've done a fantastic mm -hmm. job. Bless you, brother. Where uh, are you, brother? You, Paruski? No, 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 no. No, Poland. I'm what? coming from Poland. Yeah, well, people, okay, that's wonderful. It's great to see you today. And I oh, hope no, you it's good on this patch. What can I do for you? Actually, we are so grateful for your great job and uh, your keep me in prayer. Not so great. Go ahead. We are keeping you. We are uh, growing in numbers, and we uh, uh, I'd love to join you next week if, if it's only possible. This is wonderful to uh, see you live today, and we are looking forward uh, to see you more. God bless. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Chris. And we keep you in, my, in our prayers. Our numbers are growing. We are translating you into Polish language. We are learning from you for the last three years, I believe. Each day I have you in my ears. So this is a great privilege to be here with you. Well, it's a great honor to have friends in Poland. You are very welcome. And you know, I was, born, I was born right next to the biggest Polish person in the world. Really? <laughs> yes, yeah, Stasiu Liberty. 
Statue, <laughs> Statue of Liberty, yeah. Okay, that's wonderful. <laughs> Christoph, are you Jewish? Uh, well, I have to check my DNA. We'll see. The reason, <laughs> reason I ask is I can see a menorah in the background. I wasn't sure whether it was a messianic fellowship or just... Oh, thank you for that, that you see that. Actually, um, uh, uh, no, I'm from Nations. I'm coming from Nations. I'm, I was born in Poland, and actually I do not know... Uh, the exact, uh, you know, my DNA coming from, but I will check that in the future. So I will let you know. Actually, this is uh, the thing that very important, thanks to Jacob's teachings, I have found uh, uh, that Judeo-Christianity is very important. So uh, I believe that our uh, believing in Jesus is a long way from Jewish world. That is why we are studying the Bible. We are looking for the Jewish feasts that we need to understand more. And that is why, you know, I'm looking for the um, Jews as uh, our older brothers, that uh, word of God became through them, the Messiah come through them. And, you know, and the salvation is through Jews. That is why I, I am uh, really looking for uh, finding Jews as our friends and older brothers. That is why. Brilliant stuff, Christian. Thank you very much. It's a real encouragement. Anyone ask any questions? Yes, please. Uh, Beryl, can you un unmute your microphone, Beryl? There you go. Okay. There you go, my dear. Um, yes, the foundations are well on the way, crumbling. Um, Jacob, you know the state of the church here in the UK. Um, the sheep are scattered. The mm. teaching is... <clears throat> virtually nil apart from yourself and those who can get online to listen I, I am concerned because look you you know in scripture the the there were people who kept the church together who who kept the brethren online and shepherded them in that way um and I agree, foundation has to be of the Lord, but is there anything wrong in providing a place where we can start to mentor and shepherd them? Because they're all over the place, Jacob. We get, because they know us... Oh, not at all, but it will have to be done in small groups like the early church. Yeah, I mean, in a, in a home, yeah. a bigger home, is to keep them online, to keep... Yeah that's correct for them for to be sake fed not the fellowshipping together one with another especially as you see the day approaching but i believe the church is going to end like it began small groups yeah we've always taught that it, yes. they began in homes and they'll end in homes yes so is that a good enough foundation to well, ask the lord to if it's good enough for us and, well, no, but I'm saying, is it a good enough foundation for us to ask the Lord, should we move and provide a place like that in our home? Because well, we're only in a small place here. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Okay. I just don't want it to be anything of us. I, I, no. I want... Commit your work to the Lord, your plans will be established. Yeah, because I am worried about the sheep and I am very concerned and I'm burdened. So is the good shepherd. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Beryl. Some, sometimes we use the word burdened when actually that word actually defines love. It, it, it defines concern. Mm. And yeah. the fact that the Lord has laid that on you, then there's work to be done. And that's something, even if it's just by prayer, Beryl, that the Lord will resolve this, but as Jacob said, it's something that's small where you get the foundation. Yeah. It's like eating an elephant, isn't it? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Yeah, yeah. We'll commit it to the Lord. We always do. He has to be this the one who gives the final say, and it has to come from scripture. Thank you. Anyone else got any questions? Yes. yes. Uh, Mia, you were going to ask a question at the beginning. I don't know if you've Got a different one of the same one? Well, yeah, I was just, um, thank you for the for the teaching, Jacob. Um, thank you I as well for joining us. What country are you in, please? I'm in British Columbia, Canada. Okay, BC. Yeah. 
So I found out just this morning from Amos that the study was going to be on Psalm 11, and I had a quick read. Um, and some of the things that I was looking at, like it kind of hearkened me to Isaiah 33, um, like verse 11, because when it was speaking about when it was speaking about the uh, the wind. In Isaiah 33, 11, it talks about your breath as a fire shall devour you. Okay, is that's that talking relevant? about the Holy Spirit as well. Yeah. A walk of Kodesh, breath of spirit in, in Hebrew yes. and Greek. Yeah. Now you think chapter 33, verse 11? Yes. You've conceived shaft and you will give birth to stumble. My breath will consume you with the fire. That That's true. Uh there is a consuming power of the Holy Spirit that burns up what is of the flesh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then in 16, it says, he shall dwell on high. Mm -hmm. His place of defense shall be munitions of rocks. Again, I guess that would be also related to the foundations. Or well, yeah, when it, it, how the it, Lord, if I take, how can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? Yeah. Would that they, be relevant? That directly relates to being an impregnable rock. Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you. Where, where are you? Abbotsford or Vancouver? Where are you? I'm just outside of Lillooet, so I'm in the middle of the forest. <laughs> okay. We, we can see the snow behind you. Yes. Yeah. Nothing but trees. I don't have a neighbor. So. Well, trees are good. <laughs> yeah. are good. <laughs> have you raised your hand, Steve, or are you just looking quite distinctive? <laughs> Steve, are we going to ask a question? Hello? No, okay. Hello. Hello. Question? Uh, is it me? <laughs> Jeanette. Hello, Jeanette. Yeah. Jeanette, please, thank go ahead. You. First of all, thank you so <coughs> much. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been, oh, what's this that in Proverbs about cold water and a dry land? Um, you were saying earlier about you know, separate, the Lord is separating the faithful from the apostate church. True. Would you say it's a kind of a, almost a preview of the separate, or the beginning of the separation of the sheep and the goats? Well, or, or as in Malachi. I think a preview, <coughs> or a harbinger of it is a, is a good way to describe mm. it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and like in Malachi 3.18, I was looking at, mm -hmm. you know, where you discern between those two. Yeah, separations in the church, mm -hmm. like the separation between Israel and Judah in Old Testament Israel, all of these things illuminate some aspect of the final judgment of sheep and goats. Yeah, but, can, I, can I ask a quick one, Amos? Yes, please. Uh, Jacob, when, when Beryl was talking, and, and we know from uh, past discussions that we are looking to going back to small house groups rather than the big organisational churches, but in the current climate, for someone like myself and Rosie, we belong to a, a very small house group of about okay. 10 people. But because of the current pandemic, we've not been able to meet. And most of the people in the group are elderly and not au, au fait with things like Zoom or anything like that. So we're left now isolated, just Rosie and I, on a, on a Sunday, we have our own little little service. Um, but what concerns me is with all the, the lockdowns and all the um, impositions put on us by the government, it would be wrong for us to break those rules and meet together in a place where we could become vulnerable, even though we trust in the Lord to, to watch over us. I would say, well, obviously, we follow man's laws and rules until they cause us to violate God's. Common sense and faith are not mutually exclusive. Now, remember, elderly people, and I'm not into the COVID thing the way some people are, but elderly people and people with pre-existing respiratory conditions are the most vulnerable to infection. What I would do other than pray is during the meetings, I would simply have the people put on one of these 
and practice distancing. That's what I would do. Yeah. I would pray, I'd distribute some of these, and I would practice social distancing. Right, okay, thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Colin. Joseph, you were next for the question, I believe. Is that my No. Uh, it was Joseph. Joseph, you asked for a question? I would love to have a question. Okay. Joseph, you, you texted me a question. Do you want to ask your question, Joseph? No, okay. Steve Valor, were you had, had you a question? A question more an observation, really. Um, uh, Jacob was talking about uh, hope, uh, the foundation. Um, and mm -hmm. I think we can get a lot of hope from Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, it was that time when Ezra was reading out of the uh, law and uh, the people came under conviction. Um, Nehemiah chapter 8. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, the thing is that for the, the temple to be rebuilt, and for Jerusalem to be rebuilt, uh, they had to clear all the rubble out of the way. Uh, yes. And then they had to rebuild. And there's a sense whereby, if you will, God is clearing the rubble out of the way uh, so that he can rebuild both his temple and the city. Absolutely. Um, and so I, I think with Ezra and Nehemiah, we can, we can get a lot of hope from it. What you say is a very valid point. <laughs> Biblically, scripturally, and historically, <clears throat> additions are generally preceded by subtractions. <laughs> mm, yeah. The Lord gets rid of the dead wood to make way for new growth. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That's like Acts 5. <laughs> yeah. Amal, Amal Barathi, you've got a question? Um, yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. Where are you from, um, Amal? I'm originally India, but I live in uh, Tennessee, Nashville. Okay. Um, my We're building question a new is, place in uh, Dover, not far from Nashville. Yeah, I, I met Marco like uh, last month. Okay. And uh, he did uh, he did mention that, so I'm looking forward to it. Good. Yeah. Um, my question is, where are you from in India? Um, from the south, from um, Bangalore or Madras or Madras. Yeah. Are you um, from a Muslim background or a Hindu background? No, I grew up uh, Lutheran and Anglican. Oh, boy. Um, okay. And then um, I was Reformed for a while, Reformed Baptist. And then I was in the NAR probably oh for like two, two years. The and then and that's how I came out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, my question is, you know, you, you initially started uh, talking about post-trip. I also believe in post-trip, the same um, I don't believe in between the sixth and the seventh seal. The end of the seven years. I don't believe the rapture happens at the end of the seven years. Th yeah. that, that's what most people mean by post-trip. I don't think it's at the end. I think it's during. But Yeah, between the sixth and the seventh seal. That's correct. correct. Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly how I believe. But my question is, the fact that we know it's coming, that persecution is coming at some point, and I think it may happen in my lifetime, um, should we, is there anything we should prepare? Because Noah prepared knowing what's coming. Yeah. Well, Amal, I got an email yesterday. In the land of your birth, India, the BJP on the Morsi is persecuting mm. Christians. I was in India when the terrible floods happened in Goa, where there's a lot of Christians. And because it was Christians, the central government, BJP government in New Delhi, limited aid going into Goa because the victims were Christians. Uh, it's happening already. It's not something that's coming. It's just that it's something that's coming to the Western world, but it's already happening in a lot of other countries. Now, as far as being prepared, one, expect it to happen. Two, we must be identified with those who are suffering already. We must be in prayer and as and supportive as we can 
of the persecuted church. There are ministries like Voice of the Martyrs and Barnabas Fund and so forth. We have to be supportive and in solidarity with the Christians who are being persecuted already. That's important. The third thing is what Jesus said, when they persecute you in one, flee to another. Um, one of the reasons so many Jews died in Germany is they had adequate reason to know that they needed to make a move. But they had homes, they had businesses, they were cemented to their communities and so forth, and they somehow imagined that things would go back to the way it was before pre-Nazi Germany. Uh, hold this life loosely. I'm not saying don't buy a house. I'm not saying don't open a business or be committed to a profession. What I am saying is be committed to Christ. And if he tells you to pack up and get out, pack up and get out. Yeah. Be ready to flee. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know uh, Mike from On Point Preparedness. Um, he he says like uh, he he pretty much prepares for doomsday like scenarios. Yeah, be careful of survivalists. Be careful of yeah. survivalists. Our security is in the hand of the Lord, not hiding in a cabin in Montana or something up in the Rockies. You know? Yeah, <laughs> there's yeah. people who do that. There's Christians who do that. Okay, good. Yeah. Another cool. question, Thank please. Thank you, Mal. Anyone else? Any other questions? Joseph Bell, if you're still there, I know you'd flagged up. Uh, I have a question, Amos. Please, go ahead, brother. Um, the question's for Jacob regarding when the uh, No Bomb in Gilead book is um, coming out. The book is essentially written. The problem is the copy editing. I'm having to do a lot more on internet now because of the lockdown, which is really heavy in Britain. And well, you know, never put off, never put off until tomorrow, what you can put off until next week. You know? <laughs> Frankly, <laughs> <laughs> things keep popping up. I could finish if I had two weeks to sit down and do nothing but work on it, I could do it, or maybe three weeks. I could do it. Um, so please pray that I do it soon, though, Lord willing. It's written. All right. Yeah, we, we're keeping you, we're keeping Morielle and everybody here in prayer, so. Thank you. Where are you located? We're right now in South Carolina. We're actually right near uh, Sandy. Uh, oh, Sandy, yeah, Sandy Simpson, okay. Right. We we just um, exiled, if you will, from good old New York with uh, De Blasio and Cuomo. Oh, that guy's out, out of his mind. Yeah, that man is out of his mind. <laughs> to expound on Amal's question, in regards to just being a practical, and in regards to at least in the United States, what's going on with uh, possible lockdowns? Obviously, we know it's politicized a little, and in regards to. Um, uh, practical prepping, obviously not putting any investment in those things, but in terms of, you know, stocking up stuff or being practical, um, I would assume that that's, would be just a wise, utilizing wisdom. Look, you know, it's not good to drive your car any distance from your house without a spare tire. Exactly. It, you know, it, don't wait until a hurricane comes if you live in Myrtle Beach. Uh, to, to make sure you have batteries for your flashlight. You know what I mean? Th there's common sense. Yep. <clears throat> but I remember <laughs> I had a friend who had had a big ministry in America, even internationally, and he was selling survival kits, 12000 a month for Y2K. <laughs> Nobody got the money back. <laughs> there's a to clear, that's an example of drawing the line of demarcation. Very yeah. clear. Well, again, if I lived in Myrtle Beach, I'd make sure I had plenty of batteries. Yeah, right. 100%. <laughs> too, too late once the hurricane strikes. Right. Thank you so much. Myrtle Beach in North Carolina is, is in South Carolina, yeah. 
Oh, what? Right. Myrtle, Myrtle Beach, Beach is in South. Yeah. We're right on the border. South. Right. We're we're right underneath Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay. But so you're down by going towards Fayetteville that way, or Dillon? Yeah, not, not far from Fayetteville. You, about an hour. About you went to North North Wadesboro Baptist right. Church when you did G the Old Testament with Sandy and Donnie, right. Pastor Donnie. We're an hour and thirty minutes southwest. Okay. So we. Oh, south that right. way. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. So we're right outside of Harlem. Okay. Good. But in South Carolina. But we found North Waysboro through Sandy, through our TN. Great stuff. Thanks, yeah. guys. Sam Mather lives there, the evangelist to the Jews from New York. He's in Charlotte. Oh, great. We'll have to look him up. Yeah, we will. Thank you so much. God bless. Jacob, how important uh, is it to actually everyone. identify yes. your enemy? We are conditioned now by media, whether it's social media or traditional media, in print or in the goggle box, to, to give us our information and to give us the salient points of what's going on in the world. But what we've seen lately is that they tell us what they want us to know and they leave out what we don't or what they do. The most serious know. enemies will be those from within, not from without. But that's where I was going, the church itself. Think of Judas Iscariot. The yeah. most lethal enemy is the one within. The one within is the most potentially lethal enemy. Jesus had to reveal him. The most sinister, dangerous, deadly enemies are going to be the ones only Jesus can reveal. They show their true hand once it's too late to stop them. Now, it's good to practice discernment. It's good to be observant about things, but we should not be witch hunting. We should not be witch hunting among ourselves. But realize that the most dangerous enemies are not those outside of the church, but inside. Uh, the Judas Iscariots among us. Uh, and we're seeing it. I mean, we're seeing it. We're seeing mainstream evangelical preachers and authors go into open apostasy and turning against the faithful church. It's happening already. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, can I ask a question? Of course you can. All right. Hi. Um, Jacob, just there's been quite a few questions there about provisions for um, persecution, etc. And thinking along the lines that the Holy Spirit is going to provide for whatever we need, uh, where does that sit with um, scriptures for the last days where the, the Holy Spirit is going to actually provide? You start thinking of Elijah being fed and all those sort of things. How do you feel about that? When the Holy Spirit is taken from the world, he will not be taken from the hearts of God's people. The ravens fed Elijah. We have a teaching on 1 Kings 17 and 18 about Elijah and how it relates to the last days, and it's on that teaching. This is an older teaching, but it's on there. Like you say, Elijah, the ministry of Elijah is something that has implications typologically for the last days. And the way God met the needs of Elijah is the way God is going to meet the needs of the faithful church. Remember in the epistle of James, it hints at this. It says Elijah was a man like us, and he prayed it wouldn't rain and it didn't and so forth. Um, that teaches about the close of the age. So you're absolutely correct in looking at Elijah and also Elisha. That's the way God is going to provide for the faithful church. But realize he was in a continual conflict with the woman Jezebel. And we are going to be in a, the same conflict with that same wicked woman, the spirit of false religion. And the political authorities, Ahab, was turned against him by Jezebel. Governments and political authorities are going to turn against us by false religion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cornel, and, and I actually, I got the invitation from Krzysztof, uh, who did the translation. Where uh, are you? I'm located in the western part of Poland, just on the border. Oh, with Poland, you. okay. I, I have two private, maybe a little private questions uh, to you, Jacob. Uh, the, the first one is, um, from your experience, you, you, talk, you talked a, a lot about uh, homosexualism and abortion, um, and... I completely share your view on that, that God is against that, and um, it does not please him, He's, uh, this is a sin. And my question is from your experience, if you could share, 
how active you are in voicing your opinion on that among non-believers, let's say in professional environment. And uh, if you could also say, to what extent are we obliged as, um, as Christians uh, to, to say what God thinks about it among non-believers or believers who actually agree with that, who are around us? Um, that's the first question. The second question, um, you as a, as a teacher, you seem to have answers to every question. I don't know about that, but go ahead. But I, I want to ask you also, uh, we, know from, we know from the Bible that knowledge uh, leads people, uh, or they are more prone, let's say, to suffer from pride. Uh, and I want to ask you uh, the, the question, how do you protect yourself to stay humble in front of God, having uh, that knowledge that you have? I kiss my wife, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. <laughs> um, knowledge does puff up, or it has the potential to puff up because it, it can glorify the old nature. Uh, it can deify almost human intellect. And spiritual pride is, is, is a lethal, lethal entity to, to have to deal with. So you're absolutely correct to what you say. When God gives somebody the gift of teaching, or if he gives somebody the gift of being a pastor or an evangelist or anything where God is going to use somebody in a significant way, and I say this by his grace, he is always going to give a thorn in the flesh. He's always going to give a cross to keep us humble. Because without it, our old nature will easily usurp everything and take over and wind up in spiritual pride. Whenever you find the gifting and calling of God in somebody's life, I guarantee you that there's a thorn someplace. <laughs> the devil may, maybe you from the devil, you know, Paul said from the devil, God allows it. The thorn will be pulled out someday, but in the meantime, it's there and it's going to be there. So I, I do not trust myself to keep myself from going into spiritual pride. What I do know is, though, that sometimes the thorn hurts. In fact, it hurts quite a lot sometimes. One day, Jesus will come back and he'll pull the thorn out. In the meantime, it keeps me humble. And that's going to be true of any Bible teacher, any expositor of Scripture, any theologian. It's going to be true of any pastor, any evangelist. Anyone who God uses significantly is going to be there. The only question is how big is the thorn going to be? The size of the thorn will be in proportion to the size of the ministry. Does that answer your second question? Right, thank now you. Now, your first question, we are called to be his witnesses to everybody. Uh, I've witnessed to homosexuals. I've witnessed to uh, women who've had abortions. I've witnessed to anybody. The reason I put the emphasis on those two things, abortion and homosexuality is because scripture does. First of all, if you look at what it says in the New Testament, uh, in Jude and in Peter, the fate of Sodom is highlighted as something that's going to take place at the end of the age. We have a recorded teaching called not even a minyan, not even a minyan, about how the rescue of Lot is a type of the rapture, the rescue. Homosexuality will, like in the days of Lot, become more and more militant. It can't be placated. It's a demonic spirit. It will become more and more perverted and more and more militant to the point that the only way out will be God. The church will be surrounded. The teaching is called not even a minyan. What happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, we are told in the New Testament in two places, four shadows what's going to happen at the end. The other is abortion. The last straw before the Babylonian captivity was the sins of King Manasseh. Now, the Babylonian captivity of Judah is a picture of the Babylonian captivity of the church in Revelation. You understand? Luther understood 
the Babylonian captivity is Roman Catholicism, false religion. The church went into captivity to this false Christianity. Well, that happens again at the end of the age, called Babylon the Great. Now, it involved the political economic system as well as the uh, religious system of the world. But what happened in the last days of Judah before the Babylonian captivity is a picture of what happens in the last days before Babylon the Great. The straw that broke the camel's back, that's an expression. I don't know if you know what it means, <laughs> if English is not your mother's tongue. The final thing that made God angry and caused the ax to fall, the judgment to come, was the sin of Molech worship and the kind of Baal worship that took place in the valley of Gehenom, where they were sacrificing babies particularly male babies, firstborn male, that's satanic, try to counterfeit Christ, sacrificing their own babies to a demon idol. And they did it on a wholesale. They did it, it was not just a few, it was not hundreds, it was not thousands, it was, nobody knows how many, it was incalculable. The modern state of Israel, with no therapeutic reason, has killed more Jewish babies than Adolf Hitler. Hitler killed one and a half million Jewish children. The modern state of Israel has killed more. Once you go beyond this, a baby is the penultimate example of God's love. Only the sacrifice of Christ for our sin is a greater example of God's love than the love a parent would naturally have for its baby. You lay down your life to save the life of your baby, your child, or your grandchild without thinking. You do it in a minute. If it was you or them, you would do it. Okay. When you take, and, and God created that kind of love we have for our, our babies, for our children, to teach about his love for us. You understand? Even unsaved people can understand that kind of love. It's called storga in Greek. Unsaved people cannot understand agape, the unconditional love of God in Christ. They can't understand agape, but they can understand storga. When you take that paramount example of storga love, the love for a baby, and you sacrifice it to a demon, you've gone too far. The United States has aborted about 55 million babies. 55 million. Social Security wouldn't be in trouble. They wouldn't be reliant on <clears throat> immigration and things like if they didn't kill so many babies. Japan, Japan is going to socially disintegrate simply because of the demographics of the aging population. Western Europe is heading in the same direction. It's going to be overtaken by the Islamic population because of abortion. Uh, this is gonna be a global crisis. When a nation does that too far. God forgave many of the sins of Judah. He forgave even idolatry. He forgave ordinary idolatry. He forgave social injustice. He forgave immorality. But once they began killing kids, they went too far. Any nation or society that does that on a grand scale has gone too far. The Western world has gone too far. Even though there was a revival in the days of Josiah after King Manasseh, or Matt Manasseh, even though there was a revival, God said the revival can only delay the judgment. It can't prevent it. You killed too many babies. Even if revival comes to the Western world, even if there's a real revival, not the nonsense you see now, but a real revival, even if it comes, it will only be a temporary respite. It will only delay the judgment. But the judgment must come. That's why they had to go to Babylon no matter what. And Babylon the Great will be the same. One is the picture of the other. So that is the, those are the reasons I put so much emphasis on the sins of Sodom and on the sins of Molech, killing kids. Abortion is an industry. They killed these kids for economic, for financial reasons. They thought it was going to bring them prosperity. 
Well, today it's the same thing. Abortion, non-therapeutic abortion is an industry. You can go to New York City and look at the adverts in the newspapers, abortion clinics competing with each other for the blood of the unborn, offering discounts and coupons. This actually goes on. In a supposedly Judeo-Christian country, this goes on. Israel, the abortion rate is absolutely shameful. They're worried about the growth of the Arab Islamic population. If they didn't kill their own babies, they wouldn't have the problem. It's very serious. It makes the judgment of God inevitable. So those are my two answers to your two questions. Bless you, Jacob. We're out of time, unfortunately. We've had great teaching tonight and really um, provoking questions. We thank everyone who's managed to join us tonight. As I said, we will be sharing this as a, a recording, um, so please tell your friends. If you want to get invited to any of the programs in the near future, then simply go to RTN and subscribe to the RTN uh, mailing list, and we will let you know when the programs are coming out. So until the next time, may God bless you. May God keep you safe. Bless you all. Thank you for joining us. Please tell your friends, and remember, Jesus Christ mm -hmm. is our Lord, our Savior. He's also our rock. We stand on a sure foundation that doesn't sink and doesn't shake. Amen. Amen. Bless you all. Goodbye. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jacob. God bless. God bless. Bye, Have everyone. a good night. Thank God you for joining us. Thank Keep you. us in prayer. May the Lord bless Bye. you. For more information about Moriel, check out our website, www.moriel.org.